Good afternoon. Good to see you all back. Thanks for coming. Um, it's a great pleasure to uh, be able to start this uh, last session on the discussion on the crisis in uh, the Korean Peninsula. These uh, years, Albright Institute's overarching theme is about harnessing the power of technology, truth and trust in a world transformed. So far, the discussions have been great in actually highlighting all of the keywords in our title. It is about truth. How do we find out what is really happening in Korea, North and South, and what is really a myth and what is a lie and everything in between? It is about trust, which seems to be the one item that we have in great deficit. Nobody seems to be trusting anybody else. The world is being transformed continuously under this kind of lack of trust. And then we have technology that's trying to play a positive role, we hope. So far, it has not been able to do that very successfully. Very often, people like me, technologists, think of technology as something that if we could only harness it, we can put it to great use, and we have done so in many, many occasions in our human history. What happens, however, with technology is that very likely technology works very well every time after you test it carefully, except like two days ago in the case of, uh, of uh, Hawaii and in the case of uh, the false alarm in Hawaii and in the case of uh, Japan that also there was some kind of um, false alarm. Because we forget that no matter how well technology works, there is a human that's sitting in front of the technology that has to make decisions. And this human often has to make decisions under not very clear conditions, under pressure, under uh, fear, under urgency, sometimes under the lack of the right mental abilities to actually do the right thing. So we will try to unpack some of these discussions um, and, and these thoughts today. I'm very pleased to have a wonderful panel to my right, and I will start by introducing um, Melissa Hanham on my right. Uh, Melissa Hanman is a senior research associate at the James Martin Center for Non-Proliferation Studies. CNS is a term you will hear from time to time. She studies East Asian security and the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, with particular focus on North Korean weapons of mass destruction, procurement and proliferation networks, and China's nuclear posture. She also studies Chinese, South Korean, Japanese nuclear, nuclear exports, as well as East and Southwest Asian export control systems and proliferation finance activities. She supports MIAS research on both CNS and MetaLab by investigating new technologies, new techniques in open source geospatial analysis, incorporating satellite and aerial imagery and other remote sensing data, large data sets, social media, 3D modeling, all kinds of very exciting tech stuff. GIS mapping, she teaches geospatial tools for non-proliferation analysis at the Middlebury Institute for International Studies and is a an regular contributor to the arms control wonk. To her right is our very own Professor Catherine Moon, who will play the role of a moderator in the panel. Professor Moon is a professor of political science and the Wasserman Chair of Asian Studies at Wellesley. She is also a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institute, uh, the Center for East Asia Policy, and was the inaugural holder of the South Korea Korea Foundation uh, Chair in Korean Studies 2014-2016. Professor Moon's research encompasses the US-Korea Alliance, East Asian politics, inter-Korean relations, democratization, nationalism, women and gender politics, international migration, identity politics, and comparative social movements in East Asia. She has done extensive work in uh, writing about all of the topics that she is interested. Her current book is North Koreans and the Future of Korean Democracy, where she analyzes the impact of demographic changes in South Korea 
on Korean democracy and foreign policy. Uh, to her right, all the way from UK, is Jeon Beck, um, a uh, doctoral candidate in public policy at the University of Oxford, where, uh, where she is researching her uh, first movers of dissent in Myanmar. She co-authored North Korea's Hidden Revolution, How the Information Underground is Transforming a Closed Society, published by Yale University Press just last year. And she's the founder of Lumen, an organization that researches and sends information into closed societies. Previously, she was a research fellow at the Belfast Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard, and she worked at Google, where, among other roles, she served at Google's Ideas, Ideas North Korean expert. Um, to her right, uh, you will not be able to see it on camera, is who we'll call Mr. Kim, is a human rights activist from North Korea. Let's uh, all welcome the panelists today. <laughs> we'll, we'll go through um, about uh, until three o'clock uh, with the panelists. We'll do the introductory remarks and we'll start the discussion. And then we'll open from 3 to 3.30 uh, to Q&A. OK, super. Thank you so much. Um, so this is the really fun part of a very fun day, um, our last panel, and really a, uh, a focused discussion as a conversation among us first, and then to include you um, in the latter half or latter portion. So I shared some questions with our guests to get them thinking um, in advance, and um, we'll, I'll, I'll share the questions with you, I will refresh their memories, and then we'll just have a conversation about them. So one question that I had in mind that I find really um, urgent sometimes when I talk to people who care about North Korea, uh, the issues around North Korea, peninsular politics, all the problems around it, etc., is from a U.S. perspective, people are obsessed about North Korea as a nuclear state, and especially the recent capabilities that it has demonstrated with its new intercontinental ballistic missiles, ICBMs, that might be able to reach the United States. Um, but Mr. Kim grew up in North Korea and um, has also lived in South Korea and now lives in the United States. So the perspectives might be a little different. Uh, Ms. Jiun Baek, is a Korean American who is currently studying in the UK. And Ms. Hannum is a Canadian citizen who lives in the United States, works in the United States, so and has traveled various places and met many people who have different perspectives on North Korea. So what, in your opinion, is the most important issue about North Korea that is non-nuclear? That is non-nuclear. Whether it's short-term importance, mid-term, long-term, up to you. Jian, you want to start? Sure. <laughs> so I, th I think it depends. My answer changes depending on what part of my identity you ask. So if, if it's the more faith-based side of my identity, it would probably be trying to promote religious you know, freedom. Um, and freedom of expression for people inside North Korea. If you're asking the budding, aspiring scholar side of me, I'd say freedom of intellectual um, expression and studies. But I think just as like the citizen of the world, I would say uh, what I think is the most important non-nuclear issue is to provide all citizens inside this country of North Korea, the tools that they could use if they so desire to improve their lives in the short, midterm, and long-term future. And so I particularly focus on information, and I know that opens up a huge uh, list of other questions. What kind of information? Well, we can talk more about that later. Uh, what's true? Who's dictating what's being sent in? And what's important and so forth? But I think tools that people can use if they wish to do so to improve their lives and making um, just you know, slightly better decisions uh, for them and uh, the lives of those they love. So 
Thank you. So even with nuclear capacity by the state, tools to improve individual people's lives. Mr. Kim, what are your thoughts on the most important thing about North Korea? Um, for, the past, uh, for the past couple of years, my, the most interesting to me was um, the social change of North Korea, inside of North Korea. So unlike, the, unlike what we see from media every day, from CNN, Fox News, North Korea is a still place where ordinary people live and where people um, interact with their family and the, their neighbors and, with their, and within their society. And especially when I, as a, as a former citizen of the country, I see a lot of, uh, I see a big change in, in the society compared to my parents' generation and my generation. For example, my, generation, my parents' generation, they all went to school and they were all well educated with the philosophy of Zhuche ideology. Zhuche is the philosophy, the fundamental philosophy of the government, North Korean society. Um, I hope, you know, I hope uh, Dr. Moon explains a little bit more about what Zhuche ideology is and uh, it dominates the country. And the people believe Kim Il-sung and Kim's family as divine God. And the, however, for the past 20 years, I would say, especially my generation, the younger generation, we are departing from the government. There is lack of loyalty to the government and the people are more becoming, North, the younger generation is more becoming practical in terms of uh, their social life and then in their life. So I, I open my eyes widely and they keep closing to watch what's going on in North Korea. And uh, as June mentioned uh, previously, there is a huge desire uh, or demand on foreign information, foreign media. So it wasn't, it was not possible even 20 years ago. But nowadays, there is huge uh, consumption, consumer market in North Korea, and that the market demands information. And that the, there certainly is punishment on the people who watch or who access to the foreign information. But the desire exists the punishment. So I'm, I'm very, I'm still figuring out what's going on. And that this, I think that besides the ICBM and the nukes, I believe that, uh, to me, you know, social change of North Korea is most important. Thank you very much. Just um, to define Chuche ideology very quickly, uh, it's, we usually spell it in English, J-U-C-H-E, Chuche which is based on the Chinese characters, uh, roughly defined as self-reliance, um, self-sustaining reliance. And that has been the ideology, political, social, cultural, religious ideology of North Korea since 1959, 1960, when it became developed more fully and established. And that idea, number one, is a direct challenge to North Korea's historical past of Japanese colonialism. Uh, J Japan had colonized the peninsula. Um, so it, it stems from an anti-colonial nationalism. It also has a lot to do with uh, North Korea's desire to be a modern nation, but following its own path, its own, quote, principles. And uh, Kim Il-sung, uh, one of the founders of the North Korean state, um, had developed this with his um, people and established a whole science and art of Chuche as a philosophy. Um, and so that is what Mr. Kim is referring to, that that is the indoctrination. It's, you know, every society has some central ideological um, a set of principles that try to bring a nation together and the 
Kim Dynasty has held on to Chuche as, as such a principle. Um, Melissa, you have had more time to think about this question, and you, I know, every day are obsessed with the nuclear question, but um, what is one non-nuclear issue of great importance in your view regarding North Korea? I think for me, um, the issue I would focus on is the sudden uh, change in state, uh, an instability. Um, I, I think at this point there is enough information that has penetrated North Korea that many people feel that they have economic opportunities in the surrounding countries. And so if there were a decapitation a, a exercise, which would be uh, the U.S. and perhaps ally South Korea and Japan would execute an operation to kill Kim Jong-un and senior leadership, um, there is a concern that the regular people may not have confidence in uh, the next government that came in and may instead migrate quickly to the surrounding countries. Um, it's tough though, because for the very same reason, you want North Koreans to have a high standard of living and religious and freedom of expression and, and access to market information. So, you have to balance, you know, the, the desire for these opportunities as are allowed to every country and to every people um, with uh, the sudden disruption, uh, the movement of people, disease, um, you know, uh, the logistical uh, difficulty of South Korea, China, Japan, Russia suddenly absorbing so many people who are moving um, for a better life. Big, big questions um, and potentially huge problems. Um, thank you. Um, some other th thoughts I have had, and uh, this is where we can focus on technology since that's uh, a major theme of this year's Albright um, um, events. So all of you actually are engaged in technology in different ways. And um, I wanted us to think a bit about how difficult it is to really understand North Korea. We know that. How difficult it is to get information on North Korea. And I wanted to ask you, what are your thoughts on um, how you manage to get as accurate a set of information that you need for your work or your activism? Um, to what extent does technology help in that regard? In what ways is technology not adequate to, to get the information that you really need and to understand it? So let's start with that. And I'm going to ask actually Melissa to pick this up because um, you have uh, some, uh, some wonderful PowerPoint slides and other visuals to, to show us right. about how you do your work regarding the nuclear weapons and information. Right, so we talk about technology disruption. I've actually disrupted the entire panel <laughs> by creating PowerPoint slides that were neither needed nor wanted. So bear with me. Thank you to the panel for indulging me. So I became interested in technology not because I was born with a burning desire to uh, be ahead of the curve in technology and STEM. I have a, a, an undergraduate degree and a master's degree in basically various variations of political science. Technology for me was a means to an end, a way to learn about North Korea because I could not go there. And so the very first exposure I had was consuming media. Sometimes that media was photos, sometimes that media is videos. Um, and sometimes it's satellite imagery. And you may not realize, but there is a lot of satellite imagery that's available to you today for free on a little tool called Google Earth. And you may use Google Maps to find your way to a restaurant. Um, there are many variations for different countries. So if you don't find what you want on Google, go to Yandex or Baidu or other countries that you ma use mapping services. But what I started doing was downloading the, the Google Earth software program, and there's many layers of historical satellite imagery there. 
And um, so that's how I really, for me, that's how I got access to information. So uh, Dr. Moon already showed us this picture earlier today, or a very similar version of it. And this is a KN-08 missile. It itself has never been fired. But when it was paraded in this parade, international press were present, and we got to see it. And everyone freaked out, because this is the biggest missile they had seen North Korea show publicly before. But um, what was you know, less of a big news story was the truck that it was on top of. And Chinese citizens started pointing out, well, this truck looks very similar to a truck that is produced in China for both military and uh, civilian purposes. So China uh, produces these trucks called transporter erector launchers, TELs, TELs, in order to erect their Chinese missiles and launch them. And the reason you keep your missiles always moving, always around, is you increase the survivability. You know, by now everyone knows where everyone's silos are, and so you keep your trucks moving in and out of caves, and you're always upping the ante. But this truck here ended up in North Korea in downtown Pyongyang, and so everyone wanted to know why. Um, not me, myself, but some colleagues made a 3D model of the truck and the missile uh, because they were trying to figure out how big the missile was. So you can use a free software project that many architects or landscape designers use called SketchUp, and you can make a scale model by essentially setting the horizon lines and tracing the object itself. But you won't know how big it is until you find something in the image that gives you a, a, a height. And so in this case, the Chinese company was selling the truck, and so they gave dimensions of the truck on their website. So these people could size the truck, and they were interested in the missile, but I was interested in the truck. So this is 13 seconds of a video of Kim Jong-il visiting a warehouse and looking at some different missiles and some trucks, and that's it. Uh, that's, that's all I had. Uh, my boss is named Dr. Jeffrey Lewis, and he's also a researcher at the Center for Nonproliferation Studies. And he said, Melissa, I hear you really like making 3D models. Over this Christmas break, would you please make a 3D model of the inside of the building? Because then I will find it in North Korea. <laughs> and I said, are you? I mean, it didn't say it to his face. But <laughs> Sometimes I do now, but I was like, <laughs> Nuts, you're nuts, right? I mean, technically I knew it was possible to make the 3D model, but I, I didn't think he would find it. But I'm very obedient and respective of authority. <laughs> so I made the 3D model and, and essentially I used the things in the, in the image that I understood. I knew the size of the trucks. And so there's actually two different kinds of trucks they show us and we can unpack it further later if you're interested. There's a few articles written about this particular case study that I did with Jeffrey and one of our graduate research assistants, if you ever happen yourself looking for a research assistant position. Um, and, and essentially, I was able to model the whole room sort of scaling with what information I did know. And I came up with a, a, a building like this, and I had actually after a lot of exhaustive searching, found that the, the room had two different roofs and two different skylights on it. And I, didn't, I couldn't see all the skylights. I didn't know exactly what they were shaped like. So this is what I gave him. And he had to start searching. So he, he and our research assistant, who is, uh, speaks Korean, went through much uh, public information, articles, um, World Food Program reports, um, defector accounts which basically identified this valley as a valley where um, much of the missile activity happens. But this is still a really large surface area to search. So in order to reduce the amount of surface area that he had to search, and this is just Google Earth, right? This isn't super secret CIA technology or anything, right? This is, this is um, Google Earth. Um, we, got, we downloaded a, a set of points that showed where surface-to-air missiles are located. So think about, if you had this whole valley to search, 
would you, where would you search? You would search where all the surface to air missiles are because they're protecting something, right? So start your, start your search there. And sure enough, he found this. And the skylight is different, and we see that you know there's no windows on one wall because it had another room adjacent to it. And the reason the windows are so high up is because it has a kind of like carport cover thing there. And um, the reason that it had two different roofs is because between 2004 and 2011, which is when Google Earth had the imagery, they remodeled the roof. And so I took the 3D model I made and I put the missile and the truck inside and it fit like a glove. And this was really affirming because it meant that a 3D model made by some other group and my 3D model fit. But I had one deep fear and that was I had no idea how to park that thing. <laughs> and I thought I made a mistake. And I was afraid of telling my boss that I had made a mistake. And I was afraid of telling the world I had made a mistake. So I crowdsourced my family on Facebook. And I, I thought, I don't care if my family figures out I made a mistake. And you know, so I went on Facebook and one of my cousins was like, oh, you're an idiot. And another one of my cousins is a long range truck driver from Canada to the US and he drives produce and other goods, and he knows exactly how to take a huge truck and move it around a building. And the thing I've learned with all of this is that no one is an expert in all of the things you need to know to figure out these problems. It's interdisciplinary. What I really needed in that minute was a truck driver, and my cousin helped me. You, what he said is you put cheap, plastic and metal casters under the wheels of the truck and you push it across the floor, you slide it. It's the same way Japanese parking violations, that, or sometimes I think in DC, they'll actually, if you park your car, they'll, they'll push it out of the way. But the story continues, this place is important today. This is the Hwasong 14 ICBM. Uh, this was launched in uh, July of last year, uh, and they are launching it. This is a video that they have shared on YouTube. Uh, Google no longer shares YouTube videos, which is a little bit unfortunate for me, the researcher, um, but it does match um, uh, UN san or US sanctions um, and anti-money laundering efforts. So North Korea, there's Kim. He's inspecting as they, they set up the missile on the same truck. Uh, and the background, if you look very carefully, you will see clues about where in North Korea it is. So we can see a road, an intersection. It's a little bit dark right now, I think, with the lighting here. But you can see a road hitting another road. There's trees. We can see it's on like a grassy kind of pavilion, and there's a building there with lights on it. And as the missile takes off, even in the distance, you can see some more buildings almost like a village. So it turns out they're using the same place. And again, we were a little worried that, you know, the, in the video, the plaza has grass, and this one is, is paved in this image. But otherwise, everything lines up. And so we checked more recent satellite imagery, and, and indeed they had returfed the area for, the, for Kim Jong Un's comfortable feet. And they brought him his own porta potty, too. And um, using the perspective of the video camera, we can even see where he stood when he watched the launch. We could see where the launch was itself. And so we could learn a lot of information about this. This is where the story gets even weirder. After the launch of the Hwasong-14, North Korea threw a large banquet to celebrate all the scientists who had worked on the missile program. And during the banquet, an all-girl band dressed in Navy uniforms played rock music. You can see the drum kit in the center of the screen. But in the background, behind this rock concert, are pictures of Kim Jong-il visiting a large warehouse with missiles in the background. 
and underneath the wheels of the truck, you can see casters. It took uh, four years to prove it, that, that the theory of my cousin, the truck driver, uh, was correct. And so, but eventually, through this sharing of media, uh, we learned. There's always a grain of salt, so the only thing I would caution is that a lot of photos in North Korea are photoshopped, and a lot of them are, are, are staged. So um, we can use software to help us detect when a photo is altered many times, um, but if the photo is just staged, it is still sometimes hard to figure out exactly. So we try to create an environment with lots of different pieces of information that either collectively help us understand a situation or which disprove a myth kind of thing. So thank you for indulging me. Thank you so much. That was really enlightening. Um, we have uh, Gian Beck here who not only consumes technology information, uh, like we all do here, but also sends out, exports, not for profit, but exports technology, information technology um, to North Korea. So Gian, can you tell us a little bit, your whole book was on that, why you do it, the logistics of it, that within bounds of confidentiality, and also what you hope to get out of it. So in terms of me learning about this place, uh, I think you know, Melissa really described it aptly, which is um, it's the whole process is interdisciplinary effort, where consuming is one thing, and there's so many sources out there. Uh, Mr. Kim and I were talking about some of our favorite sources for information about North Korea. Um, consuming is one thing, um, healthy skepticism is another, uh, and trying to figure out what I believe and how I know what I know is something that is just an ongoing process. The more I know, I think the less I know, just be the less I know about um, North Korea. I'm kind of getting myself confused now with all these phrases, but it's true. And so actually the process of writing the book, I was telling uh, Dr. Moon yesterday, um, the process of writing my book is the reason why I ended up doing a doctorate. I thought, actually, how do I know what I know when I'm writing? Uh, I, I did try to fact check as much as I could about the book, so please get a copy if you can. Um, in terms of s sending information in, I think it's important. The reason why I do it, and I'm part of a growing community, a growing global community of activists, hacktivists, um, academics, researchers, technologists, um, pastors. I mean, it's a, it's a truly, truly diverse group of people involved in this initiative. The reason why I personally do it is information truly is power. Um, it, whether it, it comes in various forms. And so I think that is, um, if, if, it, if I, as someone who was arbitrarily born in the United States, um, has the most freest of freedoms in this world uh, to consume whatever I want, however I want, whenever I want, watch it or read it with whoever I want. Why not share that gift with um, some of the people who I happen to share a heritage with? Um, and it costs me nothing. It, Tell us what it is you actually do. So um, I could talk more about this in detail, perhaps off the record in a one-on-one, -on -one, but essentially is, um, part, I'm part of a network and also um, I'm growing my own organization as well to try to send various types of information and that's also it's a, trying to send information through various technologies and storage devices and media devices into the country uh, without trying, without breaking laws, rules, regulations, sanctions and so forth. And so that's essentially what I'm a part of um, and I can get into more detail later on. But the type of information is, um, of course, you know, we heard about a lot of um, entertainment and fun media going in, and it's true, it's very high in demand in North Korea. Um, K-dramas and K-pop is really popular elsewhere, and like Dr. Moon was saying this morning, North Korean people are just like us in that they have various, this very similar desires and interests and so forth. Uh, so that's very popular, but, also, um, uh, but what people may take away from a, the same drama that you and I may watch is different for 
the viewer. Um, I remember I was listening to some folks from North Korea telling me that they're watching um, Desperate Housewives and what, what there's a particular scene in that ep in an episode that shocked them, which was there was a police arrest scene, and um, and some man was being arrested, and the police kept saying these things, and it, I mean it's the Miranda rights, um, but the idea that people under arrest could be read rights and they're not being arbitrarily arrested. I mean that that's something I never thought somebody somebody could take away from you know, a particular show. Shows are important, but also news, e-books, histories about North Korea written by various, from various perspectives, histories about South Korea, American history, um, financial news, uh, economics and business tactics one-on-one, -on -one and so forth. It's some of the materials that we um, and my colleagues work to send in. I have always poo-pooed Desperate Housewives. I've never watched it, never will, but now I'm one beginning to wonder if I've made a mistake because I could have learned something about what the North Koreans would be getting. Um, North Koreans also, they love Disney, believe it or not, and they have staged their own versions of The Lion King. Yep, Lion King. Um, they can sing Disney songs uh, when foreigners go to North Korea and enjoy singing and over dinner, and, and in this way, you know they're Korean because all Koreans sing, especially you get a little booze into them and they start singing. Um, <clears throat> don't worry, I didn't have any wine, so. That is a fact, right, that is a fact. Whether you can sing or not doesn't matter, you have to sing. Um, the, I've been told by friends who've gone um, that North Koreans will break out into these Disney songs. And of course, um, they imitate uh, the fashion look, the skin regimen, the haircuts, et cetera, of the Korean star, South Korean stars that they see on the Korean dramas, the K-dramas or K-pop. Um, so they follow fads just like anybody else. Um, and what, what it, what, one time you and I had a conversation. First of all, this woman is a gold mine of just incredible creativity. So um, I am just in awe of you in so many ways. She also published a, a Yale University Press book before she got her PhD. Um, so I don't know what you're going to do after you get your PhD. But one thing that you had told me that I, f I still remember was so interesting because it's one thing to send information to another country, especially in an authoritarian or totalitarian society, and we can see why that's important. But you could also be criticized for sent, being, a one, being a unilateralist, right? Sending only information that as Americans or Canadians or whoever find important, right? And then in a way, doubling the indoctrination of North Koreans. And then you told me about uh, the possibility of feedback, that they have agency. So within limits, can you tell us how you find out, and others like you, what North Koreans want to know? Yes. Yeah, so Some, so there is criticism about this. It would be, this is perhaps another form of American imperialism. Um, because no matter how much I say I'm not biased, of course I'm biased, and everybody is biased. And so, um, and perhaps you know, Mr. Kim could speak more about this as well, but there are some activists who are able, to, and, and just people in general who have escaped from North Korea, who can and do communicate with people inside North Korea using cell phones. And I think I'm seeing a lot of nodding heads. And um, this is getting increasingly dangerous because the government is cracking down on it, not just with physical punishments, but with various new software that could catch people very quickly um, in an automated fashion. Anyway, there are, so, there's, so there, is there is real life communication via phone and text messages happening between people inside North Korea and in this particular scenario, people who are consuming information or are the marketeers um, who are then distributing and selling it around the markets. People in North Korea speaking with people outside of the country who may have been from North Korea or people, you know, Tosin joke or South Korean activists who can say, you know, what's hot inside your markets these days? What's in demand? And so let's say 10, 15 years ago, a drama that aired in South Korea may be, you know, copied and then downloaded and then you know, bootleg copied and so forth and then makes its way into parts of North Korea a couple years later. Now that process has 
It can take um, as short as 24 hours. Something that's aired in South Korea, Seoul, is seen in North Korea 24 hours later. That could be even faster than how, when, when people in Boston could be watching something, because we're trying to do things legally here. Um, so it, that just speaks to how sophisticated some of these distribution markets have become given the extreme demand for just learning about the outside world, which is what Mr. Kim spoke about before. There are just mind-numbing amounts of deterrence uh, mechanisms built into the, into the system to prevent this. However, the demand is also rising uh, and exceeds some of these punishments. And just uh, as clarification, Joseon Jok that um, Ji Yun just mentioned means um, ethnic Koreans who are living in China. They are citizens of China, they're Chinese, but of ethnic Korean descent who live on the northeast, uh, what the Chinese call Dongbei, the northeast region on the border with North Korea. And they often go back and forth. They also, uh, they sometimes can uh, talk on cell phones. North Koreans often can go to the border and pick up the Chinese um, cell phone um, uh, satellite uh, uh, potential so that they can access outside of their own border. So it's, it's a fascinating world with the technology. Mr. Kim, how do you use technology in your work on human rights? Um, how do you get, in some ways, probably on human rights it's probably the most difficult to get solid, accurate information in a timely way. So how do you deal with information gathering, technology, and also how you share what you know with others? So, um, of course, we do use technology um, in this field. We just saw, uh, we just watched it um, um, images and how people use technology to discover, to identify unknown buildings and uh, other stuff. I used to work, uh, work for uh, Curtis Melvin, so it's kind of familiar to me as well. And, um, if, and the human rights, in terms of human rights, we have a lot of, uh, we have tons of uh, uh, testimony but lack of uh, evidence. So there is uh, undeniable human rights violation happening in North Korea. And the North Korea is one of the few countries still run political prison camps and the concentration camps all around the country. And uh, that's how the, the government actually controls the society. And there is a huge, huge, and the uh, uh, huge surveillance on its citizens, and uh, if you any, if you say anything against the, the supreme leader, supreme leader, you know you you can give, you can be killed. So one of the issues was um, finding evidence, and uh, because of the development of the uh, develop. Um, emerging of new technologies like cell phones and cameras and even small you know micro video cameras now it's possible to take to get evidence out of North Korea so it wasn't initiated by I, I would say it wasn't initiated by human rights activists but somehow like you know Miss Jun did what Miss Jun does people like you know, in, in um, North Korean defector organizations or other groups, send information into the country. If you have a route, a route to something, send, to something bring into the country, which means you can bring something out of the same route, right? So now we do have, we acquire um, evidence of human rights, you know, violation in North Korea. So uh, if you search on YouTube, you can you know, find uh, some videos of North Korea and the images of North Korea. But the thing is, North Korean government is getting smarter on this as well. So because um, human rights violation, uh, footages of human rights violation you know, exposed to the international uh, community, North Korean government doesn't want to get to, to be criticized uh, for their work. 
So what they do is actually last month when I was in, uh, I was, uh, I was in Korea for a business trip, I watched a video footage uh, of a trial, public trial. And the people were like, you know, gathered in a big, it was two different video uh, footages. One was inside the building and one was on a, a, a taken outside of the building. So there was trial going on and the, all people got the, the, the people in the trial was got, they got sent, uh, they got uh, capital punishment. They, they were sentenced to be, pe to be punished as, you know, with the capital punishment. However, maybe it was, if it was uh, 10 years ago, they, they would carry out in public. But somehow, I mean, not somehow, but the, there is no, footage uh, on public execution. After the trial, the military, uh, the, you know, the police come in and they all take him to the camps. And they you know, carry on the execution inside of the camp. So no one actually go there and can take it. Even though we have evidence of a trial, we don't have actually the scene of a public execution because <laughs> North Korea, if nowadays, nowadays, you know, in North Korea, they use a smartphone. Uh, Pyongyang, they have a different, uh, over 10 different brands of smartphones. Of course, they are all from China, and they just brand it in Korean. Um, so somehow we are getting information out of the country, but at the same time, North Korean government is, you know, trying to be smart on this and re regulate, you know, trying to prevent um, those evidence go out to the country. Thank you so much. Um, in the remaining time of our portion, I would like to ask our three roundtable participants if you have questions for one another based on what you've heard and learned. So, Melissa. Sure. I, I was curious. So, so given that we all work in areas that are uh, informationally adversarial, I guess I would say with North Korea, um, how do you how do you protect your personal privacy and your electronics? Because the thing that has amazed me is how many cyber attacks I get. How many. Um, personal attacks I get. Uh, uh, and it is intimidating. I, I mean, there's nothing I can do to protect against a whole country's cyber system. So what, what do you do? Are you sure it's North Koreans behind it? No. So attribution is hard. Um, and I have to admit, for many years, I assumed it was South Korea checking on me to make sure I wasn't some kind of spy. Um, but I have the... I have been investigated by the Federal Bureau of Inve uh, Investigation, FBI, and the U.S. who handles cybercrime, and um, and it, it seems they feel it is probably North Korea, uh, if not many other countries too. But I, I mean, I, I use mul multi-factor authentication on my computers. My devices are entirely separated and. And I, I'm sure I still, I, but I was just curious, not that you want to give away your secrets, but uh, what, how do you face that kind of intimidation? And um, uh, yeah. You know what, um, so it's really, you know, for if, if, we, if I were living in you know, an you know, ordinary life, I wouldn't care, you know. I would love to post, I would love to use Twitter and Facebook and other, you know, social uh, platforms to advertise myself, right? But, you know, and I'm not in the circumstance. And so, of course, we, I do use um, work computer and the personal computer is totally separated. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my company, we have tech, tech team. And that they update uh, as long as, uh, as soon as they find uh, some some strange or whatever that is. I, I'm not familiar with tech, by the way. And they just inform us and they give the link and update it. And it's very sick. I, I, sometimes I think they over 
to do here. <laughs> of course, for cell phone, we, I use around, around 10 different apps because I needed to communicate with different groups of people in different regions. And uh, um, so some apps, you know, are um, paid, paid apps. And uh, for the st storage, um, so we are still looking for, so recently um, uh, we, we tried to introduce stealth, stealth drive and USB. It's patented uh, in Korea and in the States and other countries, so we are communicating with the company as well. And we're trying to save, keep our information safe as possible. And, but you know, it's not, I, I believe it's not 100% secure. A couple of personal tips that I've picked up along the way from journalists, other activists, and so forth, and also um, cybersecurity experts. Uh, of which I am certainly not one, is of course using two-factor authentication. If you don't know what that is, please get one. It's worth the investment. Um, also, I try to stay offline, like, like not connected to the internet as often as possible, factory resetting all my devices at least once a month, which is a pain. Um, and also, I'm trying not to use smartphones and just using you know, various old school technology. I asked um, some of my friends at Google and Facebook, what's, like, what's your best tip of how someone who's in sensitive work could stay safe? And they said, don't use the internet. And so I'm like, well, that's not practical. And so like, safety and secure, digital security comes at a huge trade-off with convenience. Um, and the more safe you want to stay, the less convenient that is. It's just a matter of trying to hit that balance. Um, I'm still learning. Hacks are no, certainly not one of my favorite things to be a target of, but I, I'll, um, I'll continue to be better. Um, this, all, everything they're saying is advice for everybody. It's not just that you fear North Korea or Russia uh, looking into your life through your gadgets and your platforms, but um, basically, you know, anybody. Um, sometimes not. Sometimes just voyeurs doesn't have to have a terrible motivation. But when they do have motivation, and when they have power to to shut you down, but disseminate also false information about you, that's pretty scary. Um, Melissa, you're going to say something. No, I just actually um, through my sudden knowledge of cybersecurity, I actually learned that domestic violence uh, is is m much of the hacking that happens are actually cases of partners who are, are trying to harm each other through um, information, internal, in-home information. <laughs> um, and actually, one of the things as I was sitting here that I had hoped uh, we might be able to open up for discussion, but um, we'll save it for the next round of Albright Institute focused on the Koreas, but um, is the the big quote topic of women and gender issues in North Korea. Um, it is a huge area of concern for a lot of people and again we have very little information on various aspects related to women's lives and uh, the gender dynamics of life for women and men in North Korea but it's something to pay attention to. Um, some of the photos I shared with you in my lecture this morning where women are the ones in the factories, I chose them on purpose, hoping that it, you would be curious. Um, and so one of the things that's going on now through the sanctions is that um, because the coal, iron ore, the major mineral resources that bring in the big bucks for the North Korean regime are off limits to a great extent, um, to a great extent, a significant S extent. Satellite imagery again. <laughs> um, the garment industry the, it, that produces quite a lot of revenues for North Korea is a very important industry. Um, and that is, of course, dominated by female workers. And something that I am concerned about when we think about what's really important regarding North Korea, it's non-nuclear. Um, I'm really concerned about how even if North Korea were to become a quote normal economy and a normal society in the next decades, I really have big fears, big worries about 
the gender discrimination, um, violence against women, and the abuse of North Korean women by both North Koreans, South Koreans, Chinese, Russians, Japanese, number one, through sex trafficking and the sex industry. Uh, it's already happening, um, so this is nothing new, but I think it would become just so widespread. And also, I have a lot of concerns about how would North Korea's economy um, be able to organize itself so as not to make the kinds of mistakes that, in terms of, of socioeconomic discrimination, gender discrimination, that South Korea's economy has already done starting in the 1950s, 60s through its economic miracle. South Korea's economy is top down big corporate entities, the small guys don't make it, the small enterprises, medium enterprises. North Korea so far, I'm afraid, is going down that path because the big trading companies that are state-run, these are government officials who run South, uh, North Korea's quasi-capitalism, um, they are becoming prototypes for, uh, to become the Cheba, the big conglomerates in the future if this were to turn into a civilian economy. And so that has a lot of uh, ramifications for small, medium uh, enterprises, and most women in most societies tend to go into small, medium-sized enterprises. And so I see already a foretelling of a future that I don't find very happy, um, even under the best circumstances. So I think um, lots to think about. And whenever you read about North Korea, or, or around North Korean issues, um, try to just go beyond the surface and uh, do what we're doing, trying to figure out how do you get the information, how do you test for accuracy, how do you test for evidence, right, versus um, hearsay, testimony, et cetera. So we'll stop our portion and then open it up. <laughs>